you so much. Uh, I wish my uh, parents that died many years ago uh, would have been here. Probably they would have gained, after such an introduction, they would have gained some weight. Um, I like uh, the, really the original title that I wanted to uh, talk today was educational uh, thing and especially how to uh, upgrade the human discourse. But I'll try to, this will, this will be just part of the treasure hunt. And uh, let's talk about the treasure hunt. In my childhood, I was, uh, I always loved uh, to read. At that time, we didn't have TV, at, uh, at things, and games, and electronic games. I loved to read the uh, uh, adventure books. And mainly, I loved the stories, like the treasure, uh, the treasure island, and the, they really ignited my imagination. Uh, I don't know really the reason why I did it, but in any, in any case, uh, I didn't imagine that uh, 70 years later I will be uh, finding the treasure and uh, a big one. So uh, let's talk a little bit about it. And uh, if you like, if you'll have time, you'll join me in a journey to find the treasure. Uh, a journey starts with orientation. And uh, it's a key word for a journey. In the old days, maps were directed to the Orient, not to the North. And that's the origin of the term orientation. And uh, if you take one of those old maps and try, not knowing this rule, you won't reach the target, right? So we need an orientation. Uh, since the Industrial Revolution, the orientation of our world is uh, mainly economic. Uh, countries are striving to maximize their, uh, their GDP. Uh, the firms are striving to maximize their profit or their value. And mainly economic or merely economic uh, matters. <coughs> and uh, however, while we did it, and it, it really paved the way to immense success and immense growth, economic growth, uh, we haven't uh, done such great uh, things to the environment and society. And uh, really, we reach a situation where we covered the, the earth with pollution, polluted the air, the water, the, uh, the ground, depleted the resources, <laughs> killed many uh, species, and did really horrible jobs and uh, that are, at this point, are threatening our existence. So uh, we must change really the orientation. And the orientation uh, should uh, change in such a way that instead of us serving the economy, the economy should serve our values. And people mentioned it, uh, uh, Laszlo, for example, mentioned it yesterday, I think, <coughs> today. And uh, so we have to change the orientation to the values. And what values should be taken into consideration? In my opinion, I think it is, uh, we, we have to be, to have a multi-dimensional uh, goal. And the, the four dimensions that I suggest are, first of all, economics, of course. And beside economics, it should be also society, it should also include the environment, and it should include consciousness in general. So good citizenship, uh, ethics, etc. In, in short, uh, the acronym for that would stand like ESEC, you know, E-S-E-C. -E and uh, the United Nations uh, understood the challenge, really, and uh, some uh, three years ago, they uh, they suggested, they offered a set of 17 goals, SDGs. And uh, I think that uh, this, uh, this should be, take, we should talk about them a little bit. <coughs> so really the threats, by the way, many people think that the threats are th a threat on planet Earth. Planet Earth will survive beautifully well without human beings. Uh, we are going to throw ourselves out of the, of the game, 
I guess uh, Toynbee, an historian, an uh, economic historian, historian, said once that civilizations die by suicide, not by murder. And uh, that's uh, what we are doing now quite successfully. So we must have a different compass. The compass, by the way, is, uh, it, it directs us, but it, it's really the metrics that we use to measure our success. That's a compass that we have to use. So our compass has to change to four dimensions. And, uh, and the metrics, how we measure our performance, really serves as the goal. Okay? So that's why it is a compass. So we need this asset. So the UN it just offered a set of 17 SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that include all kinds of uh, things. They are not really orthogonal, you know. They are not uh, perpendicular to each other, but rather each of the goal really includes the four aspects uh, that I mentioned, the, the four dimensions. But they include all kinds of things. For example, the fourth one is education, and this is one that we'll uh, talk about. The nicest thing about it is that uh, in the Paris uh, talks in uh, December uh, 2015, all countries, <coughs> all the UN members, 193 members, except for Syria, and uh, joined later, and I think I can't remember the, the other one, uh, all the countries signed to that treaty, agreed on these principles, and committed to reach these targets by 2030. And that's a major thing. It's a major achievement for the last uh, the 23 years that, that, uh, that started in uh, Rio 92. Uh, people were at the summit there. People were trying to find some joint uh, on targets and didn't uh, agree on anything, except for some four, uh, four uh, treaties, international treaties that were not that important. Uh, one of them I, I participated in, that was the PSI, the Principle for Sustainable <coughs> Insurance, that uh, was signed in, uh, in Rio, in parallel to the, to the Rio Plus 20 summit, and uh, I was a uh, Speaker there. Um, <clears throat> the uh, newly defined uh, SDGs have uh, a price tag attached to them because we have to invest, we, I talk about the entire humanity, the entire world, uh, we have to invest about $7 trillion a year annually from now, from 2015 till 2030, quite a substantial amount. Uh, most people cannot uh, grasp these amounts. Um, <clears throat> not much has been done since, since uh, the signature because, uh, you know, I'm, beside other things, I'm sharing the Association for the Visually Impaired in Israel, so I look at many things as a vision issues. So, uh, most leaders, both political leaders and also executives, are, should go to the opticians uh, because they suffer from two problems. They are short-sighted because their horizon is very short, and they are also narrow-sighted sometimes. Mm -hmm. So they cannot think in, the, in these terms. And they, so usually they think in terms of uh, millions, hundreds of millions or billions, but rarely think in terms of trillions. A trillion is a thousand times larger than a billion. So we have to look at a completely different scale that we are not used to think about. That means not only in financial terms, but also in the number of projects that have to be uh, prepared. And therefore, we need special tools to do those things. And uh, we don't have these managerial tools. And uh, it will take uh, some time to do it. In most countries don't didn't even start do, working on these directions. European countries are doing better. And uh, it means that now 
we have only 12 years left, not only 15, not 15 years, but only 12 years left until 2020. And it's clear that we won't be able to wake up a day before 2030 and try to do all this enormous job. It's impossible. Therefore, many years ago, already I knew that there will be a need for a lot of money. Already the Stern report in 2005 that just analyzed the climate change was talking about, uh, about the need for 2% of global GDP per annum. So the need for trillions was, was known. So we coined the term from billions to, tri to trillions by 2020. Uh, this uh, term really spread uh, and uh, I heard Prince Charles uh, talking about this principle and uh, using this slogan and uh, at the United Nations uh, just in last September almost everybody was talking about it and uh, they don't know that who invented it, it doesn't mean, it, it is not important. President Truman once said that at least it is attributed to him, that uh, he said that uh, there is no limit to the ability of a person if that person doesn't care who will get the credit. Mm -hmm. And it, in other words, it's a very important principle. I'm trying to, to do it, to, to use it in my life. You need, you know, it's impossible to work without an ego. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's better to have as little ego as possible because that uh, enables other people to be enthusiastic and work on it and not to compete and not hate you and you don't create too many enemies. There are enough enemies in the world. So, uh, <clears throat> but this slogan is already in use without really still understanding the meaning of it. Many people say, well, okay, we have to think in terms of trillions of 2030. But the slogan is <coughs> from billion to trillions by 2020. Note that uh, in order to reach it by 2020, we have about, how many days? About 850 days left. So <laughs> if you don't do that, we are missing the train. And uh, it's an urgent thing. And the question is, what shall we do about the managerial thing? And it's an educational project by itself, but it's not the entire educational project, and it's not the SDG number four that talks about education. So the question is what to do? Because, as was mentioned in one of the meetings just uh, this afternoon, that uh, the ability of of a, an organization cannot exceed the level of its leader. Okay, so uh, we have to to do something with the leaders. Um, we uh, established an alliance between uh, between mentors, really the the senior and the veterans of the business mentoring uh, in the world. And uh, we joined forces in an informal meeting that we called it informally United Humanity. And uh, these, uh, these guys know how to make a transformation. They know how to work with, uh, to be transformational agents. So, uh, so we had a group of about 35 people of this kind that can teach those things all around the world in, in many languages. And, uh, but it's difficult because in order to, to be effective, and we have experience in doing it, but we haven't done it on a huge scale yet. Um, we have the experience of doing it. We call it TFN labs, laboratories. It's not, we're not talking about workshop. In a workshop, you know, what the goal is, you are striving to a goal and you want the participant to join the goal later on. In the laboratory, we know the process, but the people have to do the, the work. 
and they have to define the goals, and they have to find to do it collaboratively, and they, they have to do the job. So <coughs> we have to take about 25 to 30 people, the leaders of a large business organization, a, a large NGO, government, or whatever, and uh, to take a very simple job, to take 25 to 30 people and sit for three days. By itself, very difficult job, because to get 30 people, the top people of an organization, to sit together for three days, it's next to impossible, because they think that their time is the most expensive and most important thing, and uh, to spend, to waste three days on something which has a tremendous importance, uh, they don't see the importance. So, uh, but we developed a, this process that we call TFN, the transformation, and, uh, and uh, also another method, it's a, it's a method. In three days, they do the following thing. In the first day, they uh, talk about the values, they talk about what prevents them from reaching certain goals. They redefine a collaborative goal for the company, taking into consideration the four dimensions that I mentioned earlier. And it changes their focus. Because to make a transformation happen, you really have just, sim it's a simple process. Most people are afraid of changes. And when there is a major change, they are really, they shiver. But when they hear transformation, a paradigm shift, which includes thousands of, uh, of changes, they, it frightens them. They, they, they turn off all the switches and they don't want to hear about it. However, it's simple. In order to have a transformation, you simply have to change your glasses. The, the best example I can uh, give you on this is the, uh, the example of a uh, of a, the movie Avatar. In the movie Avatar, there was a, a hero in more or less a flat two-dimensional uh, world, and uh, that person was transformed into a fantastic world, colorful, three-dimensional, and we, the audience, could see it. How? By simply wearing three-dimensional glasses, you know, the, the red and, and blue glass. And uh, okay, so we, uh, so it can be done. On the last day of the meeting, of the three days meeting, those guys know how to do it, and they are already working on a new strategic plan for the organization, which includes many breakthroughs. Many breakthroughs, things that they defined on the first day as impossibilities, or they uh, didn't even think about. It's amazing, amazing process, <coughs> miraculous really. You have to see it, you know, to understand. And uh, so then the question is, uh, okay, once they do it, they, have, they can do the work with their organization. They can use their, uh, the, the mentors uh, that they usually work with, consulting firms or whatever. So the, make no mistake, we don't compete with them on the contrary. So, uh, <coughs> so this is the, uh, the idea. There are some two other educational uh, uh, challenges, um, and I will we'll skip two of them. But I'll talk about one in, which is important. It's not essential, but it's nice to have, and uh, it's the following thing. There are discoveries uh, about human speech. The human speech is controlled by five centers in the brain. Four of them are in the back part of the lower back part of the brain. They are evolutionary uh, results of from the reptiles, from, from insects, from animals. And the part that distinguish human being from the from other animals, except for the very advanced ones that have already the frontal lobe, uh, that's a distinction. We have the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is always reacting after some thought. It's a conscious part of the brain. And the second thing about it is that this part of the brain is always friendly to the others. <clears throat> and moreover, 
this part of the brain is also responsible to a certain degree for our health. It's the straight line connecting the brain, the heart, all the, the chakras, whatever you like. So they, these are the, the claims. What happens in the brain is that there is a built-in hidden switch. Whenever these parts, the back parts, are talking, they are instinctive. They shoot quickly without any thinking. When they shoot, the switch is turned off so the frontal lobe doesn't work. When the, fr when the frontal lobe works, after <coughs> thinking, it's delayed, it, shut up, it shuts these parts. However, most people are most of the time talking from here. And this thing has deteriorated in the last uh, decade or so, mainly because of the, of the uh, technology that we have. Blessed technology connects all the people beautifully well, uh, gives us all the information, that uh, access to all the information that we need, but there is also a curse uh, connected to the blessing. The human uh, discourse has deteriorated in the last 10 years. We see it in the political things, in many governments, in European governments, in many governments, in the American government, we see this. The Twitter type of, uh, of reaction, quick, no listening to the others, not caring about the others. The kids are suffering from it. I don't have time to talk about it, but everybody understands what I'm talking. The beauty about what the discovery that we, that we have, which has been confirmed by MRI studies and things. The beauty here is that we can teach people really quickly, most probably even just mentioning this thing that you can make your speech conscious uh, is a, an amazing discovery for m many people. And you can, by just delaying your, uh, your uh, response, by a fraction of, really, a tiny, fraction of time, you, uh, you get control here, which affects also your health and the quality of the, of the course. It has a, I don't have time now to talk about mindfulness and think, it, there is some connection between the two, but really here what we have is that the conscious part takes over the unconscious part. That's a trick. And it takes really, it could take minutes to, to teach it to anybody from the age of four or so to, till the age of 104, if you like, and uh, it takes just minutes. And then you can train, you, you have to have exercises to, to get control of the process, which will improve everything. Uh, at the World Academy, just in November, that we had a meeting in, in Rome about future education, and uh, I came with my partners to, to the meeting, and we suggested to declare the year as a year of uh, higher uh, uh, speech and, uh, and to teach this uh, process. When we thought uh, deeply, it was accepted as a decision and, uh, and we are now working on trying to do it automatically through, through the internet because if we need the mentors to do it directly, and we need even 1,000, uh, one mentor per 1,000 uh, people, we'll need about seven and a half million people, uh, m m mentors, to do the job. So just to prepare those mentors will take us a long time. So we are working now on the development of this uh, thing. It will take a little bit more, but I suggest to declare the next year, like uh, the year of human discourse. We'll, it will have tremendous impact on internal security, on police, on uh, court cases, on prisons, and the uh, violence, and it will, and international discourse, uh, and, uh, and peace in the world, and it will have a tremendous effect, I, we expect, on human health. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, to the educational thing. But now, just a few words about uh, finding the treasure, okay? Billions of the trillions of dollars that are needed, we have to bridge <laughs> a tremendous gap. And uh, the claim is 
that uh, insurance companies and re more specifically retirement systems in general, pension funds and the savings and the insurance and the social security in some countries where they have funded, uh, funded plans, uh, can serve these needs. Just to mention one figure that will explain everything, the private insurance industry, retirement system, is managing for, for the savers already now about 80, 80 trillion dollars portfolio. So the seven trillion that are needed annually is not that bad. It's not, it, it is achievable. So there are some obstacles on the way, and the major obstacle on the way is that in order to attract the people's money to a pension fund, in order the pension fund will be able to offer to the people a very attractive plan, they have to get a high yield on the investment. At the current rates of, of uh, interest in the market, when the yields are, let's say, around zero per year, zero percent per year, you cannot uh, establish a good pension plan. It will not even cover the, exp the, the management cost. And uh, you need a, a good rate of return. So the question is, how to guarantee a high yield on the invest on the on this investment on retirement investment. I have to clarify one point here. The point is economics. Let's say that uh, any investor or the pension fund plan invests in a power plant. If the power plant is uh, so, the only income that the plan is making on the on the investment is selling electricity, right? From the revenue from selling electricity. However, the private investor is not compensated from other benefit that this power station may give or may cost. Um, for if the, it, we are talking about a, if we are talking about a, a power station that is a, a solar, for example, the investor is not compensated for the saving all the pollution and the health implications, whatever. If it would have been a public uh, institute that would make this investment, the public would see all the benefits, the, the, the clean air, the health implications, the less depletion of other material, etc., etc. So the yield would be much higher. Also, the, tax, the government doesn't pay any tax. So really, it pays once we have the right metrics, the right compass, compass, it pays for the government to pay for all these things and to subsidize them. It's not really a subsidy. It just, they have to correct the accounting. They have to count all the, the other benefits as benefits and the other costs as costs and to have the, the true accounting. If they don't have this, it would be regarded like a, a gap, like a deficit. So the government may have a very important role here. They can do it. There are also other mechanisms to do it. If you think that it is impossible, it's not true. Because many governments have done it. A government, unlike an individual, can pull itself off the ground by pulling the bootstraps. An individual cannot do that. And it has been done. After the Second World War, the Marshall Plan was a good example for that. Other countries, my country has, been, has flourished in the first uh, 40 uh, years due to such mechanism. I don't have time to talk about it. So here is the key. We can solve, really, with one arrow, many targets. First of all, we find the financing to combat the, all these uh, environmental issues, etc. Second, we can solve a major problem of the insecurity, the current insecurity, work insecurity of the millennials. Because it's not guaranteed that all of them will be employed throughout their useful lifetime. Third, we can also solve the retirement insecurity of the millennials. Three major issues in the world in one era. So, 
You know, you don't uh, drown by forming in the water. You drown by staying under the water. And uh, we stayed under the water. We are staying under the water for too long. So let's do something with it. Ignoring the urgency will cause an emergency. And we don't want this to happen. I thank you very, time for, very much for your <laughs> Hey, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you've heard a very different, challenging kind of uh, talk. You've surprised us, as I expected you would, with uh, a cluster of provocations, really, about how we're going to deal with the future. So um, I'm going to open up for questions, I think, first, so that we can elicit more detail on your plans. Thank you. I'll stand so I can speak a little louder. Thank you for uh, presenting to us a picture of how we could move forward. Um, a question I have for you, but I also would have wanted to ask Laszlo after his presentation. I would love to believe it, but who's going to convince Trump and Putin and Xi to mention a few key people <laughs> that this is the best vision to go for in this world? There's so many conflicting visions of what is best for this planet, what is best for our nation, whatever the nation is. So how can we bridge the gap? Uh, on that level? Well, uh, I think that we are, uh, we should take the power. Actually, uh, unlike in the previous generations that uh, governments and the large corporations have all the power in the world, all the information, we, through the smartphones, we have tremendous power because everybody is connected and uh, you have a tremendous power, and you have all the, all, the, all the knowledge that they have. You don't, they don't have more knowledge than you. So uh, we should take the power, and uh, the leaders will understand that. They understand this language. Uh, forgive me for being a bit contrarian, but I would hate for that power to fall in the hands of the Chinese or the Russian government, which it actually is falling into their hands. Uh, I don't know. That makes me very. Well, uh, you see, you see, there were some surprises in the in the last few weeks, actually, in Korea. Um, I don't want to go into the details. I know s some details about these things, and uh, you can see the reason uh, uh, plays a role. Okay, we have a question to answer. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, just correct me if I didn't get the points very clearly. First is a quick question on, would you mind clarifying again what that one arrow that shoots at the three things is? That's the, the first quick question. And then the second question, you set off your speech in a way that was quite uh, very challenging and intriguing when you said, the orientation in the last few years and today is mainly economic, and that we now need a multi-dimensional value. You know said it was merely economics. It was. It is merely economics. Merely economics. Okay. And so when you made that statement, I had thought that oh maybe you would offer us new dimension, new points of orientation. Now, but you end up emphasizing that the challenge is how to make this trillion before 2020. Okay. So that means you are taking us back to that one value that seemed to be the dominant force. Mm -hmm. And my question now is, are there no other ways of reimagining the way to deal with this educational challenge, not just with respect to raising the trillions? Because I've also struggled with that. We have issues in my country, we have difficult challenges, but often they are interpreted in terms of we don't have money. And once they say that everyone is destabilized, we are all unable to respond to the situation because everything is seen in the light of we need more money. But now and I am searching within the context of this conference, are there other ways, other values to respond to such challenges 
in spite of living in an age that thinks mainly in economic terms. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the arrow is a, one of the arrows here is the uh, the money because uh, you need to finance uh, to finance these things. The second thing is you have, we have to change the way of thinking of the leaders. They have to the, the billion to trillion by 2020. That's a that's a major challenge and that's the arrow because the financing will come with that and the. the that's a, an organizational challenge. We have to re-educate, really. It's a bad term, but we have to give a new way of thinking to engineers, to designers, to <coughs> business managers, change the accounting system to count for uh, the other measure, which are not just economic measure, but to measure thrivability. Thrivability, there are already some suggestion how to do that but switching the mind that's the most important thing so this is the, the educational thing the, the process the educational process that I told you it's a that's an easy job it doesn't require that much money mm -hmm. and it's a side issue here but it will help it's a side issue because it will increase the security and, and reduce the other uh, budgets etc but the key you're right, there are economic uh, things, but the money is there. You don't have to reinvent it. The money is there in, the, in these programs, in the social security programs, in countries that have social security, in other countries that don't have social security, like most of the African countries, it's easy to, to make a social security. We did it. I, you know, I, that's my expertise. Uh, I'm working hard with SDG Africa. SDG Afri Africa has decided just a, a year and a half in last January, not this one, a, a year ago, a, Africa decided that their only hope is to by adopting the SDGs as soon as possible. A president a Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, a, convinced the leaders and he he established an institute for SDG Africa. The, the, the foundation meeting took place in Kigali, in Rwanda, and uh, with the participation of the president who attended the meeting the whole day, unusual for a, it's the first time actually that I saw it. I've been in hundreds of conferences and arranged hundreds of conferences, and they were, you invited dignitaries like that, they never stay after the speech. And they, here, there were about 250 leaders of, of African countries and the ministers of African countries that attended the whole day, participated in the discussions, and the, the next day, the, just the presidents of all African countries had a meeting in Addis Ababa and the, to conclude the, the thing. So 54 countries decided to go on it. They are helping them. I was among the very few non-African people that uh, attended the meeting. And we are helping them. Uh, so there is a hope. Don't worry. There is a hope. What happens in Africa, it's not unique for Africa. It's also in very highly developed countries, but the level of corruption is high. And the monies uh, are being stolen and diverted. Uh, the corruption is a terrible thing. It, it really kills everything. So there should be a, a way to do that. The last point. There is another, there are other methods to deal with it. The solution that I suggested is one. In African country, you can establish social security system. That's one thing. It will create the financing. In African countries and other countries, you can uh, use uh, those digital currencies and uh, create miracles. I did a lot of work in that uh, direction, etc., uh, etc. Et there are many solutions. The solutions don't have to be relying only on government. It, they can be done otherwise. But really, private investors have to see the higher yields on their investment. 
this creates really a circular process because higher yields will encourage people to save money so there will be more money invested so you know it fits the process it fits itself i've seen the process done in my lifetime on a large scale it can be done the the, the conclusion really is do you think it, it, can, it, it can be done, that it can't be done no yes it can be done yes yes we can Yes, we can is a, a, a fantastic thing. Yes, we can is in three languages. Yes, in English, we in French, and can in Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> we have one, fine, time for one final question from Patrick. No? Okay. Thank you for the position. Uh, I'm wondering, and I'm not an economist, but after 2008, I'm fully aware that when we talk about amount of capital for money, money moving around the world in the future, that there is, that there is a disconnection between the big money and real economics. And in your presentation, which I appreciate, there's still the presupposition that there is a connection. But I'm, I'm not sure that there is still such a connection between capital and effect on society. Can you say a little more on that? Yeah, I think the, the only source for long-term capital in the, in, the, in the world framework, the only source comes from, except maybe from minor things, but the only source for major capital, uh, long-term capital, comes from pension funds. Well, that, that, because they have to invest for 40 years. Well, that's, the that's trouble, the just a minute, that, that's exactly the point. Well, that's that, exactly the point that crisis me too. Yeah. <laughs> but that's the only capital the normal people still have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's and, true. And there's not so much trust in the leadership about dealing with that capital. Yeah. Yeah. I, I fully fine. agree. I burned my fingers in that capital market already yeah, yeah. substantially. <laughs> it's a, I know what you say. Yeah. Trust, by the way, is a very important word. Yeah. There are economic studies that show it it's very easy to measure trust among people. And there are studies that show the, that countries that have a high level of trust among the people <coughs> are successful economically. Those countries where there is no trust among people are failing economically. So trust is an important thing. These are educational things. We have to develop trust, we have to develop there are many challenges, you know, I had only 25 minutes and I already took uh, 25, I guess. You did indeed, and our time is now up. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that uh, there'll be time to chat, chat with you further about, yeah. because I have many questions, but I'm not going to ask them now, because I know we have another paper, but let's give a big thank you to Professor Miller. Thank you. If I may, may say one thing, uh, you can see it, uh, at ykcenter.org, you can see the call for action and other things that are related to the topic. So look at it. So this is a map to the Treasure Island. Okay.